So uh, one of the things we wanted to do before I come and do my solar system show is I wanted to introduce you to somebody who's actually experienced being in space. I wanted you guys to have an experience with an actual astronaut. So without further ado, even though we can't all fully hear you, can we give guys give big rounds of applause to Mr. Don Thomas? And he's going to take it from here. So yay, Mr. Don! Wow, thank you all. Good afternoon, everybody. As you heard, my name is Don Thomas. I'm a former NASA astronaut, and I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I was aboard Space Shuttle Columbia for three flights and then Space Shuttle Discovery once. And during those four missions, I spent a total of 44 days up in space. And I went around the Earth all the way around 692 times. So I've seen so much of our planet uh, during those missions. And what I'm going to do this afternoon is just share with you a little bit about what it's like to live and work in space. And I'll show you some of my favorite pictures of the Earth. But I want to start by telling you where I am right now. I'm far, far, far away from you. I, I live in Towson, so I'm about four miles from Lutherville Lab there, and I uh, hope you guys are all doing well. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, this is not a picture of me, but it very well could have been me. I was six years old when the first American astronaut launched into space. That was a long time ago, almost uh, 52 years ago. And at my elementary school, they brought us to the school gymnasium. I sat on the floor and watched a small black and white TV of the launch of the astronaut going into space. And as soon as that astronaut was in space, I said to myself, I want to do that. So ever since I was a little boy, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into space. I wanted to experience zero gravity. And I wanted to be able to see sunrises and sunsets with my own eyes from space. So I always knew what I wanted to do. And it took me a long time and a lot of hard work to get there. I worked hard in school every single day in all my subjects, in math and science, in reading and history and gym and art, music, whatever I was working on, I always gave it my best effort. And I went on to college and got my bachelor's degree in physics, one of the sciences. And then I stayed in college another five years and got my master's and my doctorate in engineering. So I spent almost 10 years total in college, and I finally got out, and I started applying to NASA to get into the program. And two years after I got out of the college, uh, NASA announced they're looking for new astronauts. I was all excited. I wrote away, got an application. I filled it out, sent it in, and NASA said, no thanks. And I was surprised by that, but I didn't give up. Two years later, there was another astronaut selection. I got an application, filled it out, mailed it back in. And what do you think happened that second time? NASA said, no thanks again. And at this point, I realized I have to do more to get noticed by NASA. I wasn't even getting close in the competition. So I started taking flying lessons. I learned to skydive. I taught a university course. I learned to scuba dive. These are all things that were not requirements to be an astronaut, but they seemed to help. So I worked on all those things. Three years later, another astronaut selection, number three, I sent my application in, and this time I got called up. I made the, the group of 100 semifinalists. They brought me to Houston, Texas, and I spent a full week on a really thorough medical exam, and then there was a one-hour interview. And the medical test went well. The interview went really well, and at the end of the week, I came back to my job in New Jersey at the time and just sat back and waited to see whether I made it or not. And it was about two months later, I got a phone call from NASA, and they said, no thanks. So I'd been tur turned down three times, and I felt maybe I better give up on this silly dream of mine. But I really wanted to do this. And at this point, I moved down to Houston, Texas. I got a job as an engineer working on the space shuttle program. I did that for three years. Then there was another astronaut selection, number four. I sent my application in. I got called up for the medical tests and the interview. That all went well again. And at the end of it, uh, maybe two months later, I got another phone call from NASA telling me, uh, yeah, you had made it into the program. So the lesson I learned from all this is do not give up. It took me four tries before I got accepted into the astronaut program. So I encourage you, work hard every day in school, in all your subjects. Always do your best in everything that you're working on. And remember to never give up on that dream. And you can accomplish anything you'd like to in life. And I went from that little boy just dreaming of going into space 
to getting assigned on four space shuttle missions. And this is the crew from my last flight. And the last time I was in space was 20 years ago, back in 1997. This is the crew from that mission. We've got two astronauts in the front row with the helmets there that help us fly the shuttle. They're some of our military test pilots. On the left-hand side with the helmet is our commander. His name is Jim Halsell. He was an Air Force test pilot, used to fly the SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. And then on the right-hand side with the helmet is our pilot on this mission. Her name is Susan Still. And Susan's a pretty unique individual. She was only the second woman to pilot the space shuttle. And Susan was one of our country's top Navy fighter pilots. So it was a great opportunity for me to fly with her on this mission. And then in the background, you see five science astronauts. We're called mission specialists. And our job is to do the science on board. We work the robotic arm on the shuttle if there's a need for that. We deploy satellites. We do spacewalks. So we each have areas of specialty on the crew. You probably don't recognize that guy in the far right-hand side, but that's the way I used to look uh, 20 years ago before glasses, gray hair, wrinkles, and a few pounds around the middle here. And no laughing about that. I heard some giggles out there. Okay, there you see the space shuttle on the launch pad. I took this picture the night before my first mission. Went out there about midnight or so with another astronaut, and it was so amazing just to stand there right at the base of your space shuttle, all lit up with those bright lights against that pitch black sky. And as I stood there gazing up at it, I had incredible butterflies in my stomach. Do you ever get butterflies in your stomach? Maybe before a big test or some big event, you could get a little nervous. And that's the way I felt. I was a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, but mainly really excited because I knew in 12 hours I'm going to be sitting inside this thing blasting off. And I almost couldn't believe where I was and what I was about to do. So on launch morning, they bring us out here about three hours before liftoff. We take an elevator up the side, and then there's a little bridge, an access arm we walk across. and We crawl through a little round hatch in the side of the shuttle right where the nose is. There I am in my launch suit three hours before liftoff. I've taken the elevator up, standing in front of Space Shuttle Columbia there you can see behind me. And they strap us into our seats one at a time. So I'm just outside here waiting when it's my turn. They'll say, hey, Don, we're ready for you. I'll turn that corner to the left, walk down that access arm, and at the end of it there, you see the little round hatch or door for the space shuttle. Before I climb inside, these two gentlemen in the white suits there will help me put on a parachute, We'll get the helmet on, gloves on. And once we're all set, I get on my hands and knees and crawl through that little round hatch and get strapped into my seat. We're laying on our backs for liftoff, and we've got shoulder harnesses and seat belts, and they strap us in good and tight, like maybe if, uh, you know, in your parent's car sitting in a car seat there. They strap us in good and tight because there's a lot of shaking and vibration during launch, and you don't want to bounce out of your seat and hurt yourself or damage any equipment. Once we're all strapped in, they close and seal that hatch, and then everybody moves away from us about three and a half miles. And it's very quiet for us inside the shuttle up until about six seconds before liftoff. <coughs> at that point, the three engines at the tail of the shuttle start coming up to full power. We're still physically bolted down to the launch pad at that point. Computers are checking everything. Once the computers say those three engines look good, then we light those two white rockets. They look like giant white pencils in this picture. And the instant they light, immediately you take off. And laying on my back in my seat, I could hear the roar of the engines. I could feel the shaking and vibration. And right at the moment of liftoff, it felt as if somebody had their hand in the middle of my back and that they were pushing me up into the sky. And that's the way, you know, that's what the shuttle is doing, uh, literally pushing us, tossing us up in the air. This picture you see was taken four seconds after liftoff. We're going 120 miles an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It's literally boom, and you accelerate faster and faster every second. Eight and a half minutes later, the engine shut down. It's perfectly quiet, and you're in space. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. That was always amazing to me. You know, it, it probably takes mo most of you more than eight and a half minutes to get to school in the morning. And to think in that short period of time, you could be 200 miles above the Earth. And at this point, we're traveling at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour. 18,000 miles an hour is um, five miles a second. So imagine how fast you could get down to M&T Bank Stadium if you could travel at that speed. It would only take about two seconds to get down there. 
you could get down to Washington, D.C. in about 10 seconds. And we go so fast that we orbit the Earth, we go all the way around in only an hour and a half. On three of my missions, we had a little science module called Space Lab in the back of the payload bay. And once we got to space, we'd float through a tunnel, and then we'd work back there doing science experiments during a two-week uh, space shuttle mission. That's me on the right and Greg Lentiris, another astronaut on the left. And again, we'd work on a couple hundred of these experiments during the mission. I want to tell you quickly about two of these. I think everybody's familiar with the shape of a candle flame. You know how a flame comes up to a point. And the reason a flame comes up to a point here on Earth is because hot air rises. Hot air is lighter, so it rises here on Earth, and cold air is heavier and, and settles down. And it's that hot air rising around the candle flame that draws it up to a point. Well, in space, without gravity, hot air doesn't rise. Cold air doesn't settle down. So instead of a flame coming to a point, in space, a flame will burn perfectly round. And what you're looking at in this picture is a little pink droplet of butane fuel. It's like what we have in a disposable lighter. And we've set it on fire, and that blue ball or halo you see around it is the flame burning. And it'll just float in the air right in front of you. It'll burn perfectly spherical. And once it burns up all the oxygen around itself, it'll just go out all on its own. And scientists study things like this to try and understand some of the basic fundamentals of combustion and burning. And maybe from these experiments, we can improve our burning processes here on Earth for our automobiles, our power plants, and things like that. We also take up a lot of small plants and animals to see how they behave, how they adapt, how they grow in zero gravity. In this picture, I've got a little container with a salamander. It's called a Japanese red-bellied newt, and you can kind of see the red or orange belly on that. The salamander would lay eggs. We'd put the eggs in little chambers to the right-hand side of that container, and then we just watch how they grew and develop in zero gravity of space. And it's uh, very similar to frog eggs developing into, you know, hatching into tadpoles and baby frogs. I'd see gills forming and arms and legs and tails. And we just photographed them every day looking for something unusual that might happen when they're growing in this world without gravity. Now in space, there's no walking around like we're used to doing here on Earth. When you want to move around in space, it just takes a little push with your finger and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. And you'll keep sailing until you hit a wall or reach out and grab a hold of something to stop yourself. If you like doing a somersault, you can start flipping in the air. And you go round and round all day until you get tired and you reach out to stop your motion. So what do you think? Does it sound like fun up there? We have a blast just floating around in space. And this is a picture of Chaki Mukai. She was the first Japanese woman in space. I flew with her on my first mission. And she's just floating out of that tunnel into our little science laboratory. This is a picture of Susan Still, the pilot on my last flight. And Susan's typing on a laptop computer there on the right-hand side of the picture. And I want to point out one feature. You see how she's got her toes hooked on that vertical gold pole on the left-hand side? If she didn't do that, every time she'd hit the keyboard, what do you think might happen? She would float off in the opposite direction. But in space, if she anchors her toes just a little bit, she can float in the air, stay in position, and type on the computer all day long, just floating in the air. So space is a really fun, comfortable environment to be in. And in space, there's no up or down. I think we all pretty much agree which way is up and which way is down here on Earth. But in space, there is no up or down. And you know here on Earth, if you stand on your head or hang upside down from a tree or the monkey bars, all the blood rushes to your head because of gravity. And I'm sure you've all felt that pressure in your head from that. That's because of gravity here, and all the blood rushes to your head. Well, in space without gravity, that doesn't happen. You go upside down, you feel totally normal. And in space, wherever your head is pointed, that direction is up for you. Wherever your feet are pointed, that's down. So this is a picture of Nancy and Kevin on my second flight. And Nancy's looking at Kevin, saying, hey, Kevin, you're upside down. Well, Kevin's looking right back at her saying, no, you're upside down. In his little world here, she's the one that appears to be upside down. If I was in your classroom sitting there with you right now, I could slowly push off the floor, float above you, and sit down on the ceiling above you. That would become my new floor, and I would be looking down at all of you saying, you guys are all sitting on the ceiling today. 
and you'd be looking up at me saying, you crazy astronaut, you're up on the ceiling. So however you orient yourself, wherever your head is pointed, that direction is up for you. You never feel like you're upside down. It's everybody else in the room. And in space, we don't have a refrigerator, freezer, microwave oven, nothing like that. So all of our food is freeze dried. It comes in small plastic packages. And we bring it to this food station you see on the left hand side of the picture. There's a sharp needle that'll puncture the package and you can inject some hot water in there. The dry hard food will absorb that water, it'll soften up. And if you're two or three minutes, it's ready to eat. And we would just cut that plastic package open with a small pair of scissors and eat it with a normal fork or spoon. All the food had a little blue dot of Velcro on it. And after we'd make our meal, we could Velcro it to ourselves and just float to the window, watch the earth go by. And it was very convenient just to have your food stuck to the front of your uh, you know, a uniform up in space. Now for drinking in space, it's a little different. We can't drink out of a glass or bottle like you're used to doing here on earth. If I had a bottle of water in the classroom today, I could take the top off, tip it upside down to get a drink, and it would spill to the floor or spill in my mouth. But in space, if we did that, you take a bottle of water, take the top off, tip it upside down, nothing happens. Without gravity, that liquid doesn't fall or pour out of the cup or bottle. So we can't drink out of a glass or bottle. So instead, we drink out of little foil pouches. They're very similar to a Capri Sun that many of you may have on your lunch most days. We have got powdered drinks in them, a powdered orange juice, powdered lemonade, powdered coffee, powdered tea. We bring it to the food station. A needle pokes inside the package. We can inject water. Then we just mix it up with our fingers a little bit, poke a straw in there, and squeeze it into our mouths. And that's how we drink in space. And in this picture, you see on the right-hand side, there's a little uh, foil pouch there. That's a bag of lemonade somebody made just to keep it from floating away. They Velcroed it to the wall there. In this picture, I've got a bag of Tropical Punch in my hand. And you may be able to see the red straw from uh, the punch. And I've squeezed that bag of punch, and some of it got away from me. And what looks like a little red golf ball in front of my face there is actually a blob of Tropical Punch. Any liquid in space will form a perfectly round ball, and it'll just float there right in front of you. You could go up to it and gobble it down. Our more polite astronauts will take a straw. You can poke it in there and drink it, and you'll see that blob get smaller and smaller and smaller and disappear. Exercise is really important in space. You know, here on Earth, we walk around all day. We're using our leg muscles. We're fighting gravity, but in space, it's a little push with your finger and you just sail through the air. And everything is weightless in space. I could lift one of your school buses with one finger in space. So we don't use our muscles at all and it's very important exercise. So on the space shuttle, we had this little bicycle that I'm riding here. And we would ride this every day for about 45 minutes. It would get your heart muscle going, get your leg muscles working, so that when you came back to Earth at the end of the mission, you were still in, in good shape. Now, sleeping is a little different in space. The inside of the space shuttle is pretty small, about the size of your kitchen at home. And we don't have dedicated uh, bedrooms. So when it was time to go to bed, we'd take a sleeping bag and attach it to the wall with a couple of clips that I could show you there. And then you just float up there, slip inside, zip it up, and you go to bed. We wear the dark eye shades that you see in this picture because we go around the Earth every hour and a half and you get 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. And if you don't want the sun coming in your eyes all the time, you need to wear the eye shades. And you see how the astronaut's got his arms crossed across his chest there? You know, here on Earth, if I totally relax, my arms would fall to my side because of gravity. But in space, if you totally relax, the arms tend to come and float right in front of you. And your, your hands would actually float right in front of your face. So can you imagine you wake up in the morning and the first thing you see are two hands floating in front of your face? Astronauts are not that brave, so we tuck our arms in like you see here. And the real reason we do it on the right-hand side of the picture, you see a lot of cables and switches there. And you don't want your arm in the middle of the night floating over there, bumping a cable, hitting a switch. So we just get nice and snug like the astronaut with our arms put on the dark eye shades, and then uh, we can get a good night's sleep. Now, for cleaning up in space, we don't have a bathtub, we don't have a shower, we don't even have a, a sink like you have in your kitchen or bathroom at home. So when it comes time to clean up, 
we've got some of those uh, little silver drink bags that I showed you. And instead of having powdered juice in them, a few of those would have powdered soap. We would add hot water, mix up a bag of hot soapy water, squeeze it on a washcloth, and we could give ourselves a sponge bath to clean up. For washing your hair, we've got this special shampoo called No Rinse Shampoo. And this was developed for people in the hospital who can't get out of bed to take a shower. And it's very easy to use, doesn't require any water. All you do is squirt some of this in your hair, you work up a lather, and then you take a towel and pat it dry and you're done. I don't know if you could read it on your, on your classroom or not, but I love the bottom line on the bottle right there. It says, for beautifully clean, full-bodied hair. And I want to share with you what that looks like in space right here. That's Susan, our pilot. And anybody with long hair, it's going to float all over in space. And I'm not picking on Susan here. Even my short hair floats all over. And we say that every day in space is a bad hair day. And that's pretty accurate. I want to share with you the granddaddy of all bad hair days in space. Are you guys ready for this? Are you sure? Okay, here we go. And this is a picture of Marsha Ivins. She was born in Baltimore, and she flew on five space shuttle missions. She had really long hair, as you can see here. She wouldn't leave it like this normally during the mission. Otherwise, for the rest of us, it would be like scuba diving through seaweed. She'd put it in a ponytail normally for the flight, but just left it like this for the picture. And can you guys guess what this is? Any guess there? Yeah, this is the space shuttle toilet. It's in a small closet area, maybe three or four feet across, five feet high. Has a curtain that goes across the front, like a shower curtain for privacy. And it's got a white toilet seat in the middle, right here, uh, very similar to our toilets on Earth. But here on Earth, we use gravity to collect the waste material in a toilet. What do you think might happen in space? Well, we're not gonna talk about that here today. But this toilet is kind of like a porta potty. You may see it a football game or a construction site. And in the bowl part of the toilet down here, we have giant fans. And to go to the bathroom, there's a little white knob off to the side there. You push that forward, it activates those fans, and it sucks air from the toilet seat downward. So we use that down rush of air in the bowl part of the toilet to act like gravity to keep all the waste material from floating out. You see in the front here of the picture, right at the bottom, there's two places where you can put your feet into to anchor yourself down so you're not floating all over as you're trying to go to the bathroom. And I'm pretty sure that's more than you needed to know here today. And in space, everything floats up there. It's a great environment. If you're brushing your teeth and you want to rinse out your mouth, you can let go of your toothbrush and toothpaste. You float across the shuttle, get a drink of water. And when you come back, your toothbrush and toothpaste should be floating in the air right where you let go of them, unless one of your crew members maybe came by and kicked it with their feet as they floated past you. Okay, we'll wrap it up by showing you some of the pictures of the Earth. And whenever an astronaut has a free moment, we go to the window to watch the Earth go by. And I've got a map in my hand there. I'm trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth. And I'm looking out one of the windows here on the left-hand side of the picture towards the tail end of the shuttle. And I took a camera right up to that window, pressed it against the glass, and I took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing. And this is the view I get to see out the window of the shuttle. So there you see the beautiful blue Earth from 200 miles up. All the blue in this picture is the Pacific Ocean. The white areas you see are puffy clouds here. And typically these clouds are five or six miles above the Earth. And again, we're flying 200 miles up, so we're well above the atmosphere. On the right-hand side, you see a peninsula coming down. This is Baja, California, looking south to the bottom there. And then you see the west coast of the mainland of Mexico there as well. And if you look really carefully near the bottom edge of the Earth, uh, on either side of the space shuttle, you may see a little thin blue line. Anybody know what that might be? You can see it on both sides of the uh, shuttle there. That little blue line is our atmosphere. You know, on a nice sunny day that we have today in Baltimore, you look up at that blue sky, it looks like it goes on forever and ever. But from space, we see the atmosphere edge on. And it, it appear, appears to be paper-thin layer, just like you see in this picture. Most of the air that's protecting us here on planet Earth is in that first 20 miles. That's about it. 
And that's why when we pollute the air, it can have such a major impact on our planet. Here you see a giant hurricane. I've seen many big you know, tropical storms when I was up there during my flights. This was a huge one, uh, about 400 miles across. It was over the Pacific Ocean. And we flew right over the center of the storm here. Do you know what that's called? That's the eye of the hurricane right there. And from 200 miles up, we flew right over the eye. And I could look straight down right into the eye and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. It was really amazing to see that. The next picture will show you the eye looking straight into it from directly overhead, right there. The eye is about 15 miles across here. And uh, at the very center of the eye of the hurricane, you get very calm winds, just like a light breeze. But you know, on the outer edge of that eye wall that we see here, this is the area where you get the highest winds in a hurricane. And this one had winds of 135 miles an hour, so a very powerful hurricane. Here you see a volcano venting steam here. This is in the South Pacific near Indonesia, and it's venting steam. Over on the left-hand side near the center, you see another crater half underwater there. And these islands are all volcanic islands in this part of the world. So these volcanoes start at the bottom of the ocean. They grow larger and larger till they poke through the surface like this one has done. And then sometimes they grow into these big islands where people can live like the Hawaiian Islands or Japanese Islands. And here you see the Himalaya Mountains. And right at the center of the picture here is Mount Everest. That's the tallest mountain on planet Earth. And right here is the very top of Mount Everest. Now, I can stand in front of you today and, and uh, tell you without lying, I have seen the top of Mount Everest with my own eyes about 25 times during my missions. I call it the lazy man's way to see the top of Mount Everest, right? No climbing involved, just drinking my juice as we cruise overhead at 18,000 miles an hour. But I use this picture to illustrate some of the things I got to see and do during my career. I never climbed Mount Everest and never will in my lifetime, but I've seen the top of it many times. I've seen the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. I've seen the Amazon rainforest down in Brazil and South America. And I've seen Mount Kilimanjaro, big volcanic peak in Africa poking up through the clouds. So many incredible sights around planet Earth. And here you see a sunrise from space. Because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24-hour day. And they're all a little different and spectacular, depending on volcanic dust and clouds. And again, when you watch one of these sunrises from space, you see how thin our atmosphere is. That orange, red, blue layer you see here is only about 20 miles thick. Again, that's all that's protecting us here on planet Earth. Does anybody recognize this beautiful part of planet Earth? Yeah, this is uh, Baltimore taken from space. So cities show up very gray here. And let me put in a few landmarks for you. There you can see at the top center of the picture, Lock Raven Reservoir. And then at the bottom, you see Key Bridge going over the Chesapeake there. And if you look carefully underneath the Key Bridge, you'll see another little white line coming underneath it. That's a ship wake. So there's some boat coming out of the Inner Harbor heading out to the Chesapeake. And you're just looking at the waves the ship wake behind it there. You see a little green dot there where we have Fort McHenry. And down at the lower right hand side, lower left hand side, you might see a little X pattern. Those are the runways at BWI Airport. So you can see quite a bit of detail with your eye from space. If you look just a little bit to the left of Lock Raven Reservoir, do you see anything familiar there? You gotta look really carefully here. There you go, we got Lutherville. So that's where you guys are, right there. And I, I live right near Lock Raven Reservoir, just a few miles from you. This picture looks like a broken window, but what you see here is Baltimore and Washington, D.C. at nighttime. So Baltimore is up here at the top. Washington is down here at the bottom. Over here is Annapolis. This is I-83 going up to Pennsylvania. This is 795 going up to Owens Mills. And here's I-70 going out to Frederick, Maryland, right there. And down here in Washington, D.C., you can actually see the District of Columbia, maybe. It's like a dark orange square right at the center there. There's more lights in D.C. than in surrounding Virginia and Maryland that allow you to see the District of Columbia 
with your eye from space like that. And up in here, right by 83, just a little bit to the right of it, you may see some lights. You know what those lights are? That's all of you staying up late studying, right? Or maybe, maybe your teacher is staying up late grading papers. Could that be? That may be a possibility. Okay. Well, at the end of the mission, it's time for us to come home. We fire two engines at the tail of the shuttle. It'll slow our speed down from 18,000 miles an hour to about 17,000 miles an hour. And it sounds like we're still going fast, but at that speed, gravity takes over and we begin our fall back to Earth. And we fire those engines halfway around the world, out over the Indian Ocean, and the shuttle will fall as we cross the Pacific Ocean. It'll fall as we cross the United States. And then we end up landing, just like an airplane, on a runway down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We touch down like an airplane. We deploy that big drag parachute out the back to help slow us down. And then we just put the brakes on and roll to a stop and wait for them to open the hatch. And it takes them about an hour before they can open the hatch. When you first come back from space, you feel like you weigh about 2,000 pounds because you've been floating around weightless up there for two weeks. And then suddenly you come back to the pull of gravity. Just a normal pull we all feel today, but it felt so heavy for me. My arms were heavy. My legs were heavy. I was a little dizzy when I got back. And it took about a day or so for that dizziness to go away and maybe a, a week to get your full muscle strength back. And then you're pretty much back to normal. So this picture was taken about two hours after I landed from my first trip to space. That's me on the left, and on the right-hand side is my commander, Bob Cabana. And after we took this picture, I remember turning around, and I looked up at the word Columbia there on the side of the shuttle. And I thought to myself, what an amazing vehicle the space shuttle is. This was my house in space for two weeks. This thing protected me from that fiery reentry coming in through the atmosphere. And then one of the next thoughts that popped into my head was, I got to do this again. And have you ever gone on one of the great roller coasters at uh, Hershey Park or Six Flags here? And, and sometimes you'll get off the roller coaster and you want to run around, get back in line and ride it again immediately. Have you ever done that? I've done that many times. That's exactly how I felt when I landed on the space shuttle my first flight. I knew I needed to do this a few more times. And I went on to fly a total of four four times in space. So how about we see if you guys have any questions? That was a little bit about living and working in space. We could see if you've got some questions that I could help answer here today. Sure. And one of the things I want to do is um, let me read off some questions, Don, that they sent in prior. And if we have more time, one question that came in, let's see here on my list. Uh, let's see if I can get all the way over here. Need to view. Uh, sorry, one second, guys. So it looks like um, there was like, you kind of covered that whole thing of like why you wanted to become an astronaut. It's like, um, one of the questions they have is how did you feel when you took off? You described that a little bit, but tell us a little bit more how you really felt <laughs> as you were taking off. You know, that, that first mission, I had dreamed since I was six years old of going into space. And when I'm launching in space that day, I'm, I was 39 years old. That's like an old man for our students here. That's how, how, how many years it took me to become an astronaut. But as I laid on my back that morning, I was a little bit scared, strapped in, in my seat, hoping that everything worked out okay, that there weren't any problems with the shuttle. But I was really excited. And I compare that moment to maybe when you go on one of those roller coasters that we talked about, when the bar comes down and you're strapped in, you feel a little bit nervous but mainly really excited. And that's the way I felt. I was a little bit scared. And as we go through the countdown and we get to zero and I felt that push in my back. And once I felt that push, that means those big solid rocket boosters had lit and we knew we're on our way. There's no turning back. We're going somewhere that day. And when I felt that push in my back, I had my helmet on, visor down, I'm screaming inside the helmet and nobody can hear me in the whole world, but I'm yelling, Yahoo, let's go. Because I had dreamed of this moment for 33 years and then to have it taking place right in front of me, it was such an exciting moment. And this is what, for our students, this is what you want to you know, shoot for in life. You want to have some dream, some goal, and when you accomplish it and when you get there, it is such an amazing moment. 
uh, so so rewarding, so gratifying. So I had a huge smile on my face. I think a every astronaut would tell you the same. They wear big, big smiles on their face the first time they're launching, and you know you're finally on your way to space. But there's a lot of shaking and, and rattling going on. We're strapped in good and tight. The first two minutes is really bouncy, and then those two white solid rocket boosters separate. The ride gets very smooth for us and we slowly get pushed back in our seat. And we get uh, three times the normal pull of gravity on us as we get pushed into our seats there. So you feel very, very heavy. It's hard to lift your hand up. Kind of feels like somebody's sitting, sitting on your chest, pinning you down to the ground. It's a little harder to breathe, but it's not painful. We're not gasping for air. Just a little uncomfortable. And then eight and a half minutes later, bingo, the engine shut down and you're in space. You're floating there weightless. It's a really amazing transition. We have another, this is a great question. Uh, this question is uh, from a homeschool group, but it's like, well, this is from the Boys Latin School of Maryland, and it says, what was your favorite subject when you were in second grade? My favorite subject in second grade, you know, I, I really liked math and science in second grade. I also like gym and I liked lunch. I think every Every second grader will tell you, you like lunch, that's your favorite subject. But I, I really like learning math and, and the science. And I also loved reading too. I'd go to the library and check out as many books as they'd let me, take them home and read them and then go back and get some more. Well, there are some other questions. Now, this is from a homeschool group so that you, so they can be clear that you didn't fly by a planet. You probably saw plenty, plenty, but um, they also wanted to know, have you ever traveled to the moon? Uh, and if you were going to the moon, how long would it take? And uh, yeah, so, so describe to them about, you didn't really go to a planet, but you saw plenty and you, whether right. or not you went to the moon. Yeah, you know, only 12 people have walked on the moon and I was not one of them. I was in high school when astronauts were walking on the moon back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. It's something I always wanted to do. I thought it would be so amazing to look out and you see the earth as a round ball, maybe the size of a basketball <clears throat> just held out there. And to see the blue earth like that, I thought would be such an amazing sight. So when I was a young boy <clears throat> in high school, especially, I really wanted to go to the moon. But the space shuttle wasn't capable of going to any planets. It's too big, as you see in this last picture, and really heavy. So we couldn't fly this to any planets. It was designed to go around the Earth. We orbit the Earth, as I told you, once every hour and a half. And, and that's what the space shuttle was designed to do. Um, we hope to send astronauts to some of the other planets. And I'm going to show you a few missions here. We hope to go back to the moon. And it's, it's about a two and a half day trip to get to the moon and two and a half days to get back. And what we'd like to do is build a lunar base, as you see here, and have our astronauts live up there for maybe you know, a month, three months, six months, just to learn to live independent of Earth. And then from there, maybe we send some astronauts out to visit the asteroids. These are missions that you know, our students today could be participating in down the road. This is a mission landing on one of the uh, moons of Mars. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. I think it'd be so amazing to be this astronaut in the bottom right-hand corner right there and just to see, you know, look over your shoulder and you see the red planet Mars behind you. In about 25 years from now, we hope to land astronauts on the surface of Mars. And those astronauts that will be doing that are not old astronauts like me. The astronauts that will be heading to Mars are the astronauts today in Lutherville and across the United States and around the world. This is the generation. You're called the Mars generation. It will be somebody in your class there, your school, your age group, that will probably be the first ones to set foot on Mars. And a trip to Mars and back will take about three years round trip. It's about four months to get there, four months to get back, and then you'll spend almost two years on the surface of Mars, doing some exploration, collecting rocks, and looking for signs of life. Now, I think you mentioned this, but another question, this is from Burnett Academy. What do stars look like when you are in outer space? Okay, we didn't talk about that, but stars are, are pretty unique in space. When you look at stars at night on a nice clear night, you look up at the stars and you'll see a lot of them out there and they twinkle, right? 
and that twinkling or shimmering of the starlight is caused by the light coming through the atmosphere. And it causes that little shimmering effect. So here on Earth, stars twinkle. Up in space, we're up above the atmosphere. So there's nothing between our eye and the star itself. So stars are steady, steady pinpoints of light. It, they look just like they do here, except they do not twinkle. They're just steady pinpoints of light. So astronauts never sing that twinkle, twinkle little star song up in space. It doesn't apply up there. What does the moon look like from a being up in space? You know, That's the moon, from uh, Rick, Ridge Ruxton School. Okay. The moon looks just like it does here on Earth. You know, it's, we're only about 200 miles closer. The moon is about a quarter of a million miles away. And we're only 200 miles above the Earth in the space shuttle. So we're not much closer to the moon. So it looks very, very similar. The one thing that looked different to me from space was the sun. I thought it was much more intense, much brighter in space. And that's because the sunlight doesn't get filtered by our atmosphere. As the sunlight comes through the atmosphere down at the surface here where we live, the atmosphere, you know, refracts and reflects and absorbs a lot of the light. So in space, when you look near the sun, and you shouldn't even look at the sun ever, but you would glance near it and the, it was just so bright. I had to block it with my hand. I couldn't get anywhere near it at all. Let me ask you this. I'm going to unmute this first classroom here. L. Williams is your thing. Is there anybody in that classroom that has a question? Anybody here has a question? Uh, um, how long would it take to get to Mars? To Mars, it would take you about four months to get there and four months to get home. And then you will spend about two years on the surface of Mars. And the reason it's a, a three-year round trip, Mars and Earth are going around the sun. And you want to launch when Mars and Earth are close together. But as soon as you launch, the planets start getting further apart. And you have to wait that two years for Mars and Earth to get close together again. And that's when you're going to return and come back to Earth. So the whole trip will take about three years. All right. So the next group, I see Michael P. here with these two guys here. Do you guys have a question? No. No, you're good. Awesome. I'm going to go to the next classroom. All right. I see you. How about, uh, let's see, did I skip anybody here? All right, so I guess it's your classroom now. Hear the word shine. Anybody in this classroom? You got a question? All right. Um, how about, uh, hey, come on up here. You'll be next, sir. All right. Okay. If you were to go to an asteroid, how long would it take to get there? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I showed you that picture. I'll go back to that one here. My computer's froze up here. But uh, yeah, to go to an asteroid, it kind of depends on how close it is. We would probably go visit what we call some near-Earth asteroids. Most of the asteroids are in the asteroid belt between the planet Mars and Jupiter. Mars and Jupiter. But there are a series of asteroids that come closer to the Earth. And those missions, we think, go into one of those asteroids and come back. They take about two or three months. Great. Now, the next one I see here is Bridges Montessori. Do you guys have a question for it? Yes. What kind of animals um, were in space? Okay, that's a really good question. We didn't talk about that, but I flew that salamander. We also had a lot of goldfish and little guppies. We had fruit flies. We had baby jellyfish. And uh, what else? We had that one experiment had a lot of rats that we flew on board. So we take up a wide range of, of different uh, animals like that in space just to see how they grow and adapt in zero gravity. And I think all the astronauts love growing plants and we liked working with the animals in space as well. All right, Anthony, my future rapper astronaut, what's your question, sir? Uh, uh, how long will it take to, for us to actually completely consider going to Mars? Yeah, you know, we are building the rockets for that today, Anthony. Uh, NASA's building a new series of uh, rockets called the Space Launch System. 
So we no longer, we're not flying the space shuttles anymore. We're building these new rockets and they're the biggest rockets ever built. We will test launch one of them. The first one will be late next year. So we're about two years away from that. And with these new rockets, it'll give us the capability of going to uh, the planet Mars and to the asteroids. And the first time we put astronauts on board that rocket, it's about five years away. And we hope to send them around the moon. So they'll be orbiting the moon five years from now on this rocket. So we're, we're building the hardware today. We're building the rockets. We're building the spacesuits for Mars. And we're building the, the lunar habitats where, where, where people like yourself are going to live on Mars. And we're just learning how to do all that. And about 20 years from now, 25 years from now, we'll have all the pieces ready and we'll be ready to send our astronauts there. Yeah, many people, they have 2035 circled on the calendar, but probably 25. So it's like somewhere between 2035, 2042. By 2050, there are people who want to make sure that there are humans living on Mars. It was a great question, Anthony. Let me go down here. I see someone named J6UK. I'm going to unmute you. Do you guys have a question there? There you are. What's your question? Um, how many times did you pass Earth's moon? How many times did we cross Earth's moon? Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, we, we don't travel that far out to the moon, but every time we'd orbit the Earth, every hour and a half, you'd see, we'd see the sunrise and the sunset, and you could also see the moonrise and the moonset. So every hour and a half, we'd see the moon come up and go down. So that's about 16 times in a day. 16 that, times. Yep. Is that, is that right? 16 times? Yep. Great question, my dear. All right. Let me come on out here. Let's see. How about Karen Jenkins? What do you, you guys have a question? Yeah. Did somebody in the in Miss Jenkins class have a question? I see you. I can't hear you. You may have to, un I unmuted you here. Make sure I can hear you. All right, while, I, while you guys figure that out, I'm going to ask somebody else. Uh, how about um, anybody over there at Ridge Ruxton? We did ask your one question. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, man. <laughs> All right, so what's your question? Brian, ask the question. All right, does anybody want to ask a question from your guys' classroom? Uh, no, thanks. All right. <laughs> All right, and how about the Barron family? Do you guys have a question for us? All right, I'm going to go back to over here to Bridges Montessori. Do you guys have a question? Yes! All right, come ask astronaut Don a question. Have you discovered any black holes? You know, on my space shuttle missions, we didn't discover any black holes, but NASA has discovered a lot of these. We think that at the center of every galaxy, there's a black hole there. And at the very center of the Milky Way galaxy, that's part of the, the galaxy that our sun is a part of, we think there's a supermassive black hole there. So we think they're very common. We don't see them very often. You know, they don't give off light at all. And uh, so you don't see a black hole. You can only see the effects of it. You might see, uh, you know, stars getting sucked into a black hole, uh, but, but you can't actually see the black hole itself because the gravity is so high that l not even light can escape it. Great question. Let me see if there's anybody over there with Miss uh, Karen Jenkins. Do you guys have a question? I still can't hear you, though. I see hands up. If you can type me a quick question, uh, or yeah, let's see. I saw you walk in front, or you can type me a question that you guys may have. Uh, oh, we may, okay. 
Gotcha. All right. Well, we're about to wrap up right now. You guys have really been amazing. And uh, so you guys will see me in Lutherville for the Blast Off with Janet's Planet Solar System show. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I can't wait to see you at Arts on Stage. Don, do you want to close out with any last comments that you want to make sure these great boys and girls uh, should know or remember from our time together today? Yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you today, sharing my experiences of going in the space. And the one thing I want you to all remember is to never give up on your dream. I'll bet many of you have an idea of what you want to do when you grow up after high school, after college. Well, keep working hard towards that goal and don't give up on it. I almost gave up after I'd been turned down by NASA three times and I thought this is too hard. They don't want me, but I really wanted to do it and kept pushing through. So you want to work hard in school every single day. Do your best in all your subjects and never, never let go of that dream of yours. And again, you can accomplish anything you want to in your lifetime, whether you want to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, a rapper, a professional athlete, whatever you want to do, you know, keep working hard towards that goal. Well, here's what I would love to invite you guys to do. If you want to group your kids around the screen, let them face out. I'm going to let Don kind of say hi and keep waving. That's why his, his, is he's going to exit out of his presentation here. Uh, if you'll stop sharing your screen, Don, he's, his face is going to come up. You guys can totally see Don stand in front of your screen or your smart board and take a picture with an astronaut in there in the back of you. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so you just have to go down there, Don, and stop sharing your screen. And then you guys all come right in front of Mr. Don. Oh, good. All right. So we've got Don up here. I'm going to let him start talking. And, okay. You got everybody. And when, when you get in front of the screen, let's do a thumbs up. Yeah. Like Make this. Sure you see the big thumbs up. Big thumbs up. Because that's where you guys are heading. 